Dňa Otca i Syna i Svetého Ducha. Amen. Dňa Otca i Syna i Svetého Ducha. Amen. Dňa Otca i Syna i Svetého Ducha. Amen. Heavenly King, Advocate, Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere in heaven and in the Lord, treasury of blessings, bestower of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all that defiles us. And no oh, good one said, save our souls. Christa Bosha, let to be jack with a two zoot fish, the two nahodu, over it or then drew him, diligently a nashim jetiamu fiasin three. Prot what to be a suit of fish, let's for us at all, do her and us, we clean us, um, us, you will start us his tertia, so we will be chorus no, rozmoviate of two hodeno, na chorus nashu, na chorus take the dash and us, check out. Od zeta kým nám dory istúca, zaužde, není povček čas. I na výky, výky. Dobre, Vladeko, blahoslovič. Blahoslovič. God bless you, I don't have another choice. Thank you, thank you, Vladeko. OK, a Christina, Christina, are you on here? Is Christina with us? Yes. Yes, she is. Christina, why are you doing this to me? Me? Why don't you have any? Don't you have anybody more interesting to talk to or have talked to you? I'm really honored and even flattered, but I hope that you're not disappointed and hope that the next hour goes well. But oh, I you can never disappoint me. Because I turned this down about three months ago. You asked somebody asked me, and I said, Ah, ja nemaj mm -hmm. so And and uh, but you kept coming. So I guess that's because Ladik asked me to ask you. Is that it? Why? Yes, I, I think so. <laughs> I can't say no to Vladeko. Hi, old friend. Okay, guys, uh, for the next hour, anytime you can just blank out your screen, go to sleep, leave. I will not be surprised. Usually I just fall asleep. But um, if you can stick with me, I hope it's of benefit to you. I've never met a camera I didn't like. <laughs> so so I, I'm looking at one now, and I hope the, the, uh, I can... Uh, I can um, uh, keep you interested for the next hour. Dobre? For the first 20 minutes, Christa, you said I'm supposed to talk about, I'm supposed to talk, right? Yes. And then for the time after that is like um, interaction? Yes. Okay, dobre. Okay. Um, uh, I was playing, speaking with Father Wayne already. Uh, we go way back to our seminary days back at St. Joseph at in, in Washington. But I'll go back even further than that. I was uh, born uh, in Ukraine. I, our, we're the 49ers. Uh, we came over from Germany in 1949, uh, Ellis Island, that whole experience. My parents, after a year down in Texas, in your eparchy, Fort Worth, we, uh, Tato, uh, longed for the, um, we paid off the farmer there for, for, for sponsoring our passage over. There was Tato, Mama, and there were uh, four, uh, four children. Um, and so we spent a year in Texas, paid off the passage, and um, um, Tato missed Ukraine so much, and, and the Ukrainian church, that we then ended up moving up to Ambridge, Pennsylvania, what I call Greek Catholic heaven. There's Eastern Pennsylvania, the Shafties are all from, coal, tide, coal area, Western Pennsylvania, is the, uh, uh, the factories, the steel mills. Ambridge was American Bridge Company. Tato worked in a steel mill. We uh, had a home right across the street from the church. St. Peter and Paul, Father Krokmani, God rest his soul, was the pastor. And every time the bells rang, we went to church. Tato became the cantor. Mama did the cleaning up in church. And uh, me, I was a captive. Uh, a captive uh, believer, I had to go to church every time the bells rang. Seriously, it was really serious. Um, Tato never forgot that it was by the intercession of the Mother of God and uh, through the um, uh, protection of our Lord and the angels that we got to America, for which I'll, I'll always be grateful. Um, oh, yes, better English. Okay. Good. And so uh, uh, I, I do speak Ukrainian, but that's because Tato used to beat me. Um, <laughs> uh, whenever uh, I learned from Tato, um, which is, 
what, what language are you speaking? And then Deya Remin, Deya Remin. And he would grab the belt, Remin, and chase after me and my sister Irene because we were speaking in that forbidden language, English. Um, he said that someday I would, I'd be grateful, and I guess I am. But at the age of 15, at the age of 15, I ran away from home. I couldn't take it anymore. Tato, today, Tato would be in jail for what he did to, to us kids. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also, it's a, I, I, I mean, uh, lovingly, he used to, he used to really, he, he, he beat us out of, he, 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 uh, with a smile on his face. <laughs> Tato speaks in our Yagnat Bille, which is the same for for Aniska Hovrilov Kati. At the age of 15, I ran away from home. I went to the seminary. I think a lot of us. I think somebody someday, Father Wayne, you'll have to do a doctoral someday. Vocations. Is it possible that vocations come from dysfunctional homes? If you did a study. How many vocations come from homes where the kids, the boys, the, or the girls, they can't wait to leave home to go somewhere where there's a predictability, a stability, a regular uh, uh, expectations in your daily life. And you don't have to worry about the mood swings of your poor parents, especially your fathers. And it's not that I'm faulting them, but do you know, I mean, what would you how, uh, talk about, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress? What they went through with the wars, with, uh, with the, uh, you know, six months of, of totally un, 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 uh, un, um, uncertainty as to how they were going to get their family to safety. What Tato and Mama went through to get us to America and what they saw as they were making those travels, what they left behind, it's amazing that they were as sane as they were. But nevertheless... Home life was not easy, and I think this happened to a lot of our immigrants uh, with a third, with a third, with a third wave. At the age of 15, I went to St. Basil Seminary in Stamford, Connecticut. I loved it. I didn't know any. No, I loved know any better. I loved it. It was great. There were 110 guys in high school. 110. We slept in two large dormitories, double bunk beds. Uh, 48 guys in each. In each, uh, in each room. Uh, we lived by the bell. It's 5 30, you get up, everybody, you go to the bathroom, you line up to wash up, you line up, you, you, you line up to get to go downstairs, you go to the chapel, magna silencia, no talking, knock, knock, you kneel down, knock, knock, you stand up, knock, knock, you, you, you sit, you listen for the med meditation, you do the low, low uh, chitna slujba bosha every morning. Uh, there with, uh, with Father Skinkowski, God rest his soul, and, and Father Bayback, and, um, and Father John Squiller, God rest his soul, and the others. And, um, and then knock, knock, and you go downstairs for breakfast, which was great. Slava Isusuristo, Slava Navike, and we could talk. Magna Silencia from night prayer in the morning to the, um, to the greeting at, at breakfast. It was a very regular routine, one which was very good for me, which I enjoyed. Um, for uh, spent five years in, in St. Basil's, uh, three of high school, graduated in the year of 61, um, uh, two years of, of uh, preliminary uh, philosophy, uh, two years uh, of college, and then in 1963, 63, um, Metropolitan Ambrose Tanishan, God rest his soul, uh, sent uh, our class, which was the first class, um, uh, to do this. Instead of staying in Stamford, he sent, I think he had a fight with Metropol uh, with uh, Bishop Schmandjuk, but whatever. Um, the, they, they sent us to, to, uh, to uh, Washington and, um, in 1963 for philosophy. And there I met Father Wayne, Father David Clooney, Father Tom Glynn, Father uh, Klimchuk, um, um, fathers, um, and a number of others. And they, it was like, a, I, I was this kid from Western Pennsylvania who had a very narrow experience of the world, and they decided to adopt me. Father Wayne, you can correct me if you wish. They decided to adopt me, and uh, they used to say, make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. They're going to make me into a gentleman. 
They're going to show me the wonders of the world, what a beautiful, and Washington was a good place for it. Washington, D.C. was the one, we went to Catholic University of America, uh, walked down to the, uh, to the university, um, uh, the uh, conception, Immaculate Conception Cathedral, beautiful campus, and all of a sudden, the world was a huge different, different place, because we went from a, if you know Stanford, St. Basil's, it's like a arsenal, you know, it's like a, uh, it's enclosed fortress. We rarely got a chance to go, well, once a week we did our gotchis on Tuesdays, you can go downtown to do your underwear, okay? But basically, you were really restricted in there. In Washington, you're walking down from St. Joseph at, and there's 5,000 students at the university, and half of them are co-eds, girls, women which was an immediate, a big, big, big shock to people who had been locked up for five years. Uh, it uh, really, um, um, it could, it, it, um, it sort of like made you consider your vocation in a very, very healthy way. By 1965, I had, uh, I had decided to, to, um, to um, ask my wife, uh, uh, not to ask my wife, but uh, to uh, consider what the, the vocation belonged, what my mother's vocation, she was so pious. She was so pious that is it her vocation or mine to be the priest? And so in 1965, I, was, I left the seminary. I asked for a year off. They said, no, you had to quit. They would not give you this discernment sort of thing like they really push these days. They, I had to quit which in those days that you quit the seminary, you were a spoiled priest. You were not, you were, you were no, you're gonna damned and your poor parents at home had to suffer the gossip of the people back home. But anyway, I left, uh, I wanted to go, I was really gun ho I was going to be the military of Vietnam to make the world safe for capitalism. And, but uh, Father Wayne, Father, uh, Father David, uh, couple of others, they said, no, 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 no. So they put me, they got me a job teaching in New Jersey, right across the river from Perth Amboy, where the pastor was Father Stephen Sulik, God rest his soul. I became his cantor for a year. And in that year, I realized that I could not not be a priest. I loved church so much. Every Saturday night, I would go there for Vespers. Every Sunday morning, I'd be there for, for Sluva Boja. And then I'd spend the weekends there on the couch at Father, uh, Father Sulik's being his cantor. When that was finished, when that was, uh, the year was up and I had to decide what to do um, because it's either back to the seminary or Vietnam. Um, I asked if I can come back to the seminary. I remember telling uh, uh, Father, I think it was Father Wayne. Father Wayne, I think, I remember crying saying that I have to go back. I, I, I happen to be a priest. And so um, went back to the seminary in uh, autumn of 66, 67, 68, and uh, finished my studies. But what happened was in that, in that year, God decided to, I guess, accept my offering of myself. I was willing to be a celibate priest for the sake of the priesthood. And he said, no, no, I know better. And so he sent me my Irina, Irene. We were, the all, the, uh, there was a place called Mount Loretto. It was an orphanage on Staten Island. Oh, about a dozen of us worked there uh, from, uh, from the seminary for a summer job. Wayne, um, David, and uh, uh, Marty Canavan, and a number of others. Adam. And, uh, pardon? Adam also. Adam, Adam Polisha, God rest his soul. And, and uh, so there were, we, it was a one, we were like family. We were really brothers and sisters there. And two of the sisters were Irene and Christia Bishko. Christa Bishko was fell in love with Villa uh, uh, with uh, uh, Villa Corta, Victor Villa Corta uh, from Lima, uh, from Peru, and there was this most beautiful Ukrainian girl in the world. I wonder if she's listening to me. Anyway, so, and, and and I well being myself, I just fell in love with her. Okay, at first she didn't like me because she thought I was just uh, um, well, I was the south ear, but um, eventually though. All the good guys got ordained. Father Wayne, I stood at your ordination next to Irene at St. Nicholas. We stood there. We both cried as you were on the floor there, be becoming a celibate priest of our church. And we cried together. And perhaps that got us starting. We've been crying together ever since. 
<laughs> by, the time, by the time I finished my theology, actually, I, I went back to, I was in seminary. The last semester I had to finish at the Marian House with the Polish order, with uh, um, Theodore Polchinski and such, because already Metropolitan Ambrose knew that something was up, because I was constantly getting these letters that smelled of flowers with this beautiful feminine handwriting at the seminary. Uh, Father David and Marty would kind of smuggle them into me. And, um, and so um, uh, I spent the last uh, semester with the Poles uh, in, uh, at the Marian House, which was really great. I learned to sing Salve Regina and got an appreciation for the Roman liturgy down there. I finished my studies, Irene finished her studies, and then we, um, we got one more minute. Uh, then we uh, ended up um, um, uh, getting married in 1969 at Soyuzuka at the, with, uh, at the hands of uh, Father Husar was there, uh, the pastor, uh, Father David Clooney, uh, Father Nicholas uh, Deresh, and Father Marty Canavan. Uh, in 69, 1970, uh, in, the, in 69, we then moved up to Canada at the invitation of um, uh, Bishop Isidore, who said through his secretary, Father Matthew Burko, uh, who had, was a married priest, ordained by Bishop Bukatko, and he had been studied in the States, grew up in the States, but he got to be a married priest up here in Canada. He said, come on up, we'll see what we can do. We did. In four hours, we got our landed immigrant status. Things were simpler then. In four hours at the border, we came across. I worked for a year teaching. Uh, our first daughter was born, Anastasia. Uh, Father Wayne, you ordained, uh, you, you, you baptized her. I believe you baptized her. Yes. And then uh, Anastasia, then uh, Bishop Isidore, then accepted me for ordination. Um, for he was not allowed to ordain married candidates to the priesthood. So he had sent my papers to Patriarch Yosef. Yosef sent back and said, This guy was born in Ukraine. Green Domen and Alajit, he belongs to me. Ordain him. It's legal fiction, but it works. Uh, you ordain him for the arch eparchy of Lviv. So mm -hmm. I don't tell him over the, oh, they don't want me anyway. But, uh, but I officially, I was ordained for Lviv on loan to Toronto. The loan has been now 50 years plus <laughs> up here in Toronto, for good or for ill. The, um, um, the bishop almost immediately sent me to, I, I served for the first four months at St. Nicholas Church. Um, got my uh, uh, tutoring at the hands of Father George Fedorio, Yuri Fedorio, a liturgist, a beautiful man, a holy man. And then um, they sent me to Welland. Five and a half years, I, I went to Welland, Ontario, where I studied Klopistica. Klopistica. You know what Klopistica is? Yes. They don't teach that to you. They don't teach that to you in a seminary. Klopistica is how to get along with Klopi. There, they, they, there was a parish council there that ran the parish. It was their church. They built it, they loved it, and they protected it out of love from people like me, who were so smart that they were gonna just turn everything upside down and bring them, make Byzantines out of them. You know, I was going to do it right. Like for example, um, the Plastonitia should be on the altar during the uh, procession on Easter Sunday morning. No, they wanted it to be with us going around the church on Easter Sunday morning, along with me carrying a little statue of Jesus and a flag. Well, anyway, things like that bothered them. And it just, that's how it just started. After five and a half years, uh, after three years, I remember running to the bishop and saying, I've made enough mistakes. Please let me go back, uh, um, uh, uh, transfer me somewhere. But Isidore, and this is very good for you, Bishop. What did he say? De te hoches ite. Where do you want to go? Which puts the and it put the ball in my court, and I had no answer. So I spent another two and a half years there until until I said that's enough. I got my job. I got by then we had three children. I got my um, uh, one one person who told me, "Don't be foolish. You got a family, father. You're going to fight with these people all your life. You've got an education. Go get a teaching degree." I went to Teachers College just down the road in St. Catharines at Brock University. Got my degree. Was offered a job teaching in uh, north of Toronto here. And um, at the same time, Father uh, John Tataran was uh, sending his couple deacons out here to start a parish. The area out here was going to boom, and it certainly has. And so they asked me to come here. I did. 
I got a job teaching. We served for four years in a school gym, 15 years in a rented facility for a dollar a year. Those were the days. Uh, we bought property 10 years later in 95. We were able to build this church. Ta-da! This is, okay. We were able to build this church. It's another like that. And um, uh, on the outside, on the inside, it's um, um, on the inside, it eventually looked like this. Everything that we wanted, that we dreamed about in seminary, Father Wayne, I got it. God, <laughs> God you know, God takes care of what? Drunks, God takes care of drunks and fools. Yeah, you know. I was not the brightest bulb in the uh, seminary, as Father Wayne will tell you, but <laughs> for some reason, God decided to take care of me. And I would say, but the thing is, and we have a parish now that is about as ideal as you can find in this rather unideal world. Um, but the reason for that is not that I'm so smart. Well, the only smart thing was, I just, it's, it's, I did not want to fight with the parish councils. And I think, I did not want to go to a parish where I had to spend 10, 15 years to try to un, un you know, not that what they were doing was bad. They were survival mode. They were, the people brought with them what they knew from Galicia, from their parishes, and they prayed that way. But when you guys send us to the seminary and you open up the, 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 the Ordo Celebrazione, you open up the beauties of our church and you go into the parishes and say, well, it's nice. I mean, I like supplicatia. I like, the, my, my mama prayed the rosary. The, the statue is great, wonderful. Uh, the bells uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, the benediction and such. But this is not what we study. And so what happens when you go to a parish and you find yourself facing a parish that, that has another practice, it's a problem. With me, I had the luxury of starting from scratch, as they say, tabula rasa, from scratch. It was all my, uh, not my, but it was, it, it was my, my ball was in my court. What I'm gonna have in, what I, today, 50, 45, 44 years later, is because I was involved in helping to make it come true, okay? It's, it's my, uh, you know, you make your bed, you sleep in it. I was able to make the bed in a way that it is pretty comfortable to sleep in today, maybe even too comfortable. But God has a way of juga to us, okay? Because I'll tell, tell, tell you, mention that in a minute. And so, so um, uh, in 95, we built uh, the, uh, a, a church that, um, that, um, uh, that would make my parents, our Ukrainians from Galicia, happy again. With the domes and, and, and such, you know, that, but the big, big difference was that inside the church, the primary language was English. And I found that by having, by not fooling the people, but by giving them a church that looks like that, a church that looks like this, on the outside, so when they're driving up and the bells are ringing and the, it's a church, and then when you come inside and they hear, blessed be the kingdom of the Father, bless the Lord, oh my soul, that's the, they're less likely to be upset by it because already they've been softened up by the fact that obviously the people here love our tradition, but I love it so much and you guys I think will agree. We do not want to become caretakers we do not want to be undertakers. Yes. We want a church that's going to take root here in the new world and be passed on to our children and to their children. And so um, 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 I've lost my strain of thought. Okay. But anyway, so, so, so that's what I've got here. A, a, a worship service, uh, a prayer service where our primary language is English. But we, we, I have, yeah, Moshe Bokanitsko, but it's Nimi, yeah, Nimi Bokanitsko, Hobo Yotakosh. We've had to uh, thread the needle on how do you, how do you meet the needs of your parishioners who are everything from 130 years in Canada to the people who just got off the boat yesterday? 
How do you meet them? And how do you make what we've been given, which is such a treasure, such a, such a beautiful, beautiful gift of our church, our worship, our way of living our lives, how do you make this take root and grow and be passed on to, the, to our children and grandchildren? I have a wife. We now have six children. Uh, we have 10 grandchildren. When they're home for the holidays, they stand with us. They pray with us. They sing with us. Um, if you watch the YouTubes, you'll see them there with us. And uh, uh, I've got a vested interest here. I don't want them to be uh, ending up in the Roman church, although if they have to do that, God bless them. Definitely, I don't want them to be lost to others. I want them to grow, to, to worship God in the faith that my parents gave me. Charity begins at home. Where they end up, that's in God's good hands. But I'll do my best to pass on to them the treasure that has been given to me. And so on that score, I will, it's been 50, 44 years here, 1976 I began, and uh, it's been 50 years plus of priesthood, and I'm still obviously excited <laughs> about what I do. And it's all because I'm doing something that is, um, is still a source of, uh, source of joy to me. So that's half an hour. I've got 30 minutes left. Dobre? Questions. There's lots of gaps in the story. It's up to you. Prosha So, Father, first of all, uh, thanks so much for being with us tonight. And I wanted to ask you, what percentage of people in the parish are of Ukrainian background and which percentage are not? And how do you, what are the biggest challenges you find in making those two groups work? And how do you solve them or how are you working to solve them? Uh, I have very, very low um, memory retention. What was that first? There are three <laughs> questions. First, What's you the, line them up. I'm, first I'm, with you. I'm with you, Father. Yeah. So, first, what is the percentage of Ukrainian background people and uh, non-Ukrainian in your parish? Well, we began with almost all Ukrainian Canadians. Almost all. And English was going to be the language, just like at St. Uh, uh, St. Demetrius Church. Okay. With gradually, though, especially now with the fourth wave, <coughs> we have to deal with the blessing, sometimes mixed blessing, of the fourth wave. How do you meet their needs? Uh, the evangelicals are doing it. The Pianistatnik, the Pentecostals are doing it. The Baptists are doing it magnificently in Toronto. Why should our Ukrainians be going to their places to worship? So, how do, so we, they have to hear their language, but at the same time, you can't, Ignore the people who built this church and are, uh, have made it possible for them to come to a community, come to a church. The percent, percentage now, I say about maybe about 50 50. 50 50. And I would say that if it were not for the fourth wave, uh, the, the attendance would be, um, will be, would be halved and not, not nearly as, as, as dramatic as it is now. So I say about 50-50 in terms of Ukrainian who have come over recently, although most of them are going to churches in Toronto because they're still a ghetto, but uh, there are enough there that like the uh, very traditional, you know, Kavan, Pachayev, uh, Uniu style that they come to my church here. That's, uh, that's the percentage of people. Secondly? So what are the biggest challenges you find trying to serve both groups and how do you try to solve those problems? Okay, um, how do you do, <laughs> you know, Solomon, I think, had that problem, <laughs> you know, if you have children of your own, you have that problem. How do you, when, what we're, we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be worshiping, okay? We are priests. They give us the, uh, the vestments, they give us the, uh, the gospel, they give us the chalice. Uh, you're a priest. You're not supposed to be a community activist necessarily, although that's important. A social worker, although that's important. You're supposed to be, you're ordained, you're given the tools of your trade, which are your clerical, um, 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 what's called, um, uh, accoutrements. And so um, I'm supposed to lead them in prayer. How do I pray with them? I'll tell you something, Father. When I pray in English, I pray with my mind. When I pray in Ukrainian, I pray with my heart. And I find that praying with my heart as I get older, 
is more effective than with my mind. The intellect has to be used in your worship. The people have to understand their their um, their their uh, the, what 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 they're saying, what they're praying. You ha and this has to be passed on to their children and grandchildren. If you hope to do that with uh, with them, um, they they have to. Um, uh, but but the language ultimately the language that is used is is the language uh, uh, what they see what they experience it goes beyond words okay and so when they come to church um, wh what we do our part of the solution is we have one solution baboja I could do that right from the start we have a shirnya on Saturdays at seven primarily in English hospital families no problem but Utrinya right. Sunday mornings at 8, also primarily in English. Sometimes little things in Ukraine. Slujba Borja, one Sunday is primarily in English. Next Sunday is primarily in Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And when the people come into a church that looks like this, they're walking up the driveway, the bells ring, they walk in, the ikonostas is there, the candles are lit. They walk in, and the singing is going on. You know something? The, the words are not as important as the experience of it all. And so what we find is that by, by uh, and we use the same melodies that the people recognize, Yedinorodne Sinna, Only Begotten Sons, Holy God, Sati Borja, Nikarugemiu, you know, let us submit to be right. We use the same melodies, and after a while, they don't know what language, they just know that they are praying. And so by doing what's familiar, even if it's in English, and you need the English, in fact, without it, I think we become a museum. By uh, doing it in a way that's familiar, you can pass it on. You can make them feel that they are in a, it's a very, very special place because you're not, you cannot ignore the emotion that comes from worship, not just the intellect, but the emotion, their experience. And so what we've done is we have one Suj Babosha, alternating languages on Sundays, Tropari and Kondakir are interesting. The first one on Sunday is always first in Ukrainian, and then all the other Tropari are in English. And there's like eight of them, because my son insists on taking the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the temples, uh, uh, Elias uh, Tropar, the, the saint of the day Tropar, there's eight or nine, okay? But, but Tropari, uh, anything that's complicated, very often gets, becomes in English. Because I find that even, even if you'd like to do it in Ukrainian, it's not easy to find people today who will stand up and read the epistle in Ukrainian, even if they were raised Ukrainian, the Psalms in Ukrainian. And so by using English, uh, you're, you're praying, but you're also enabling uh, the, the, the kids, uh, others to become involved in it in such a way that it, they can take ownership of it. But one liturgy, alternating languages, afterwards, after that one liturgy, they go downstairs, we have a hall, they have coffee, they have social. There's no organizations because I did not have them here. We just didn't have to have them here. And so there's no cliques and such, but the people gravitate to their particular groups. And they do get a chance to see one another and to, to, uh, to uh, socialize after liturgy downstairs in, a, in, in the hall. Um, one liturgy. One other thing. Somebody want to ask me a question about the calendar down the road? Put that on the back burner. We'll discuss that as well. Dobra? Okay, no, go ahead. Father, why not go ahead with that now? Let's talk oh. about calendar. Oh, okay. When we first began, it was an English-speaking parish out of St. Um, um, Saint Demetrius. But very soon, I found that Toronto is so old calendar that I wanted to be a part of the Toronto. So we went to the old calendar. Okay? With time... And it was fine. Well, it's a very traditional parish. The church burnt up in, uh, uh, in 30, after eight, uh, 38 years of existence. For four years, uh, for three years, we were in a school gym. During that time, we found ourselves serving on the school calendar. So like Christmas, which is the, essential, the most important thing that impacts, well, we had it celebrated on the 25th because January 7th, school was in. We could not use the forum for Slujba. And therefore, we did that. And then when we moved into the new church, I said, 40, 40. That's a significant, it's time. It's time for us to make the change. 
and we went to the revived Julian calendar. The Greeks have been doing this for a hundred, over a hundred years. Novo Julianski calendar. Mm -hmm. Agreed by most of our hierarchy that this is not a bad thing, maybe a good thing even, but it's really problematic to implement and so they're backing off. But a parish like mine, which is out in the middle of the boonies, which has um, a, a despot for a, para, a pastor who can say this is the way it's going to be, my, the motto in my church is my way or the highway, better for do so. It's, 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 so we, I said, we're going to the revised Julian. Christmas is on the new calendar with the rest of the world. My children can be home at Satavicharya on the 24th, 25th. We can, we can carol for the next two weeks, almost two months, no problem. But Christmas is that. But Pascha is with the rest of the Eastern Church. And so Pascha is, is on the old calendar. This works. In my parish, works. And I think that if we are a church that is oriented towards the future, we cannot ignore the 25th. At the same time, we do not want to be a schizophrenic, you pay, I pray sort of a situation. This is our, I, my personal, uh, my personal uh, piety is determined by the fast that lead to Christmas, by the fast that lead to Pascha, and I cannot be doing Preter um, Pivi at one service, and then five weeks later, I'm sorry, it's also canceled, and five weeks later, uh, and Preter and Pivi uh, afterward. You, you can't be split like that, okay? And so uh, uh, you have to decide, are you going to stand on one side of the, of this bridge or any other side of their bridge, but it's going to have to eventually be decided. Maybe not in our time, Vladiko. I would not want to have to make a decision for you, but in my parish, we made it and it works. I lost a couple of families. One of the families just goes away for a month, but they come back here for the rest of the year. And, uh, and most of the people are grateful. I cannot ignore the 25th. Yaro dinu yusetkuyu Christmas all. And there's nothing to keep me from not celebrating it on the 7th with Guido and Baba once again. Actually, I can do it twice. But nothing official. The church's calendar is the church's calendar. The new uh, revised Julian Novo Julianci calendar. It works once you can implement it. Okay, Father, deacons, yes. Mission Institute students, uh, anybody have a question for Father? Oh, I have a question about calendar. For example, if somebody uh, from the first wave ask you to, I don't know, to bless, for example, na preobraženja za starim kalendarem, to bless apples, do you do it? Are you doing it? It's a, it's a normal day. The 19th of August is the 19th of August. We already had preobraženja on the 6th. And so I do not have a služba boža on the 19th. But since I do not have a Sujba Borja, the question does not come up. I do not do a daily Mass, by the way. It's uh, holy days and weekends. So, Here in St. Louis, we bless fruit or whatever on the uh, day in the new calendar. And if people come to us on the old calendar and ask us to bless fruit or Pascha baskets, we bless them again. We're happy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll bless it every day of the week. You know? Yes, indeed. It's, it's, it's nice that they want that they want it, but at the same time, the church has to have a, 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 a chrebet. You know, it has to, this is what we're doing. You're not going to do the liturgy of Preobrazhenia all over again. By the way, January 7th is interesting, because January 7th, I do have a Slushma Bosha. It's an access of St. John the Baptist. Yamaya Slushma Bosha Samoho. You know, Prekodya. Shemish Dali Kalyaduyemo, Tak. Ale Slushma Ye Ivana. And, and that, but to have another liturgy a second time, our parishes become schizophrenic. The poor priest is ripped apart, and you don't do that to yourself. Oh well, you have do what you have to do. But I, 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 I feel sorry for those poor priests who have a church who, in that church, at a nine o'clock liturgy on one calendar, and then a ten thirty liturgy on the other calendar, and how they manage these people will go straight to heaven for being able to, 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 to serve the people like that. But in the long run, 
I, I just don't know how they manage. God bless you if you are in that situation. Bishop, don't let that happen. The poor priests, they can go crazy. Anyway, got it. So that's, yes, if they ask you to bless, bless. Okay. Absolutely. Love that. Thank you, Mother. Anyone else? I've got one. Uh, so, so, so for those parishioners uh, uh, of yours that that are not uh, ethnic Ukrainians, uh, how did uh, how did how did they first uh, stumble up upon you? Uh, I, I guess I'm wondering uh, how did how did you get those people that didn't grow up in the Ukrainian tradition to discover you and to actually and to keep coming to your parish? My grow it. My, uh, well, what Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. The Roman Catholic Church was, and still is, okay, in many ways, very, very beautiful. But our, uh, the beauty of our church, you walk in and immediately you, you, are, you are flooded with all these, these essential experiences that are nonverbal that tell you that this is God's house and you want to be there. Hopefully, the liturgy is also reflects that too, but most of our churches are already beautiful. So people come in, and they are struck by the beauty of, their, of, of the God's house. Then, if the liturgy is taken beautifully, where it is structured, it's order, there's care, there's precision. Now, that can become a problem too, because but 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 uh, because it has to be it can't be an idol. But if the liturgy is a living, uh, a spirit communicating service, then they'll they'll stay. My deacon here, proto deacon David David Kennedy. For some reason, God sends me Irishmen and Slovenians into my life that 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 make all it make a U good Ukrainian out of me. Because I was introduced to our church by non. Ukrainians to a certain extent. I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. The church of worship was beautiful, but it was Galician and very Greek Catholic. Okay. It was through the Irish in my life and the others, St. Joseph's and such, Father Wayne included, that, that showed me the beauty of our church. My deacon, subdeacon here, was ordained in 1978 in my church when we were still, still in a school gym. He came here in 1985, 86, and he's been my deacon since then. All those years, that's 20, 30, 35 years. We've danced together at the altar for 35 years. Sometimes I can't stand myself. How he can stand me, I don't know. The man is a saint. But I've learned to pray with him in such a way that we were both approach the altar with joy. The... Um, 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 now that, that's one example, okay? Kennedy, um, um, his son is now uh, studying to be, uh, he's a deacon, he's studying to be a priest out in Edmonton, he was at Catholic University. Um, who was the, some of the other guys that, that have been here? Um, oh boy, I should, um, the, the Ukrainians, non-Ukrainians, well no, Timothy Jordan, there's, there's all sorts of non-Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians who are gifted, who are really Byzantines in Roman Catholic bodies. You know, you've heard that problem. They, 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 for some reason, they've been gifted by God to appreciate our spirituality, our worship, our beauty, and hopefully find themselves in a community that accepts them, even if they don't speak Ukrainian fluently or at all, and welcomes them into the family. And you find all those things together, and they come. By the way, without the non-Ukrainians in this parish, I would not have this parish as it is. They've really made a difference. It's like when you add a touch of 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, Karin or a touch of uh, a chasnik to your to your to your food, it, it changes the taste completely. Same also in here. The non-Ukrainians have really made a difference here, and without them, I would not have Saint Elias Parish the way it is. So, I don't know if that answers the question, but they come. And very often they stay. Some of them keep on going, but very often they stay. Who else has a question for Father? I do. Uh, Father, um, you mentioned that uh, the beauty of the church and the good liturgy uh, are important. Um, 
with respect to keeping all these non-Ukrainians um, in the parish. How important is good singing to your mind? That's, do you want to listen to, to, um, to opera where they're stumbling over the words, where the orchestra is out of tune, where they do not follow the direction of the concert master, that, where there's no, where it's just chaos, you know? The singing, our, our singing is absolutely important. It can become an idol. For me, I have a problem. If they're singing wrong, singing wrong, you can't, if they're praying, it's never wrong. But if they're singing something that is different from what I expect, I can't pray, which is terrible. I should be able to pray if they're totally off. But so for me, the singing is so important that if they're not singing nicely, I can't pray. But for the normal person coming in, for somebody coming in, even our our basic singing sounds magnificent to, yes, to Roman Catholics. They come in and they can't believe how the people are singing together. Uh, the Carpato Rusin, especially the Carpato Rusinian chant that only a mother could love. Um, forgive me, no, no. They're, what the singing is when they hear the people singing, even if it's but it's from the heart and it's all done uh, uh, in community, it is really quite moving for us. Galician chant, our chant, uh, Galician chant as the core, because I think that um, we, should, we should also take the best from other traditions as well and make it our own. But Galician chant is, the, is such a gift. It is such a gift. The, the melody lines, the melodies, the, the harmonizations, it is so easy to sing this stuff. You don't need a fancy choir. You know, you got three Ukrainians, you got four voice choir, you know, also <laughs> for political parties, but that's another story. But, but, but you, you don't need a, it, it just naturally lends itself to sing. But you should start together. Oh, this is my thing. You should start together. You should start on pitch. You should, uh, the cantor shall not be Mr. Caruso. Take that microphone away from him. What's, uh, Chris, are you there? Once you got them started, take that microphone away and let the people sing. I don't want to hear you singing over everybody else. Not you, Christia, but the cantor should not be louder <laughs> than everybody else. Start to, in fact, the ideal cantor, you don't even know who it is. If he uses his body language and his hand and just emphysemic breathing, he can get them to sing together. You know, are you guys familiar with my website, uh, St. Elias, Friends of St. Elias? There's 555 YouTubes, Friends of St. Elias. About the eighth one is Bishop Benedict at our place. See how the cantor directs the singing in a way you don't even know that he's there. It's like spontaneous where all these singers come from. Music is absolutely important. If you go to a restaurant, I think it's similar to in a restaurant. Are the tables clean? Are the napkins in the right place? The knives and forks here, the spoon over there, is there a candle? Are there real flowers? Is the atmosphere? Is everything in place nobody cares? The music for us is every bit of the thing with our church appearance, but the music as well. If the music is attractive, pleasant to the ear, that already communicates the text, the gospel, the faith. Um, but if it's ugly, if you've got a if it, not that it's ugly again, because nothing is ugly if it comes from the heart. But let's face it, I don't, I don't want to listen to bad, bad renderings of the New World Symphony or or uh, the uh, um, whatever. You know, if it's not, you know what I'm talking about, okay? If it's beautiful, it will attract, and uh, the singing should be beautiful. Invest in your cantors. Get a good cantor. Have them. Give them the materials that they need. You know, I, I say that our cantors are the ones who are the who used to turn the pages. When when we upon upon uh, Nicola, uh, Nicolai back in um, uh, back in, in, in most of our parishes, the cantor has the books. He reads the Slavonic. He has the books. The guy next to him turns the pages for him. 
Dobre taki pijaci. You know, you know, he turns the pages for him. When this cantor at the age of 93 dies, who becomes the cantor? The guy who used to turn the pages. Pages. Right? And so the chain, and now he turns, so he does the singing, and the guy kid next to him does that. And so it's like playing telephone. You, the, he sings what he thought he remembers from the previous guy. And after a while, it doesn't even resemble what the original might have been. No, and, and, and but it's, it, it becomes very, and by the way, he sings it in such a way that nobody can repeat it the same way twice. He even can't repeat it the second way. To st- so every, anyway, so he will not repeat it and, uh, and it hasn't passed on. At 93, we have not taught anyone how to sing Rizvotvaya Krista Bojanaj. You know, you have not taught the people how to sing without you. And when you die, panic, panic. Dobude Jakob, nema. You know, and you end up having low masses where you just have to read, which, if all else fails, good. But we have a treasure in our church singing. But it, it, you invest in it. The priest is not the most important guy in church. Christian, you know who the most important guy a person in church is? Yes, I do know. That's right. The jack. The jack. Have you heard the story about the, uh, the parish in, uh, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, when old Karpato Ruska Parafia Takabula? They had, they had, it was a big, big parish, and uh, they had um, uh, a priest, a very organized, sang magnificently. A new priest comes, who's got a, he's a pan doctor. He's got doctrine in theology, got a list of, a whole list of letters after his name. He has a fight with a cantor. All priests have a fight with their cantor. I know because I have my son, he's my cantor. We're always at loggerheads, okay? And it came to the point where the priest comes to the council, parish council says, Comitet, Abu Bin, Abu Ya. Either he goes or I go. Comitet thinks about it and says, Father, a priest, uh, a priest, <laughs> a good, a good <laughs> cantor, we can't find anywhere. Uh, all, anywhere. But a good a priest we can find anywhere. <laughs> a good cantor is a treasure. And so the, 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 the most important person, the one the faithful person in your parish is the one who leads the singing beautifully. You come and go. I come and go. But the cantor is the one who is constant in that parish and invest in him. Make sure, if they're all possible, that the singing is beautifully done. It is absolutely essential, along with welcoming Christian living on the part of the community. Yes, indeed. Does anyone else have a question for Father? Maybe about Brampton. St. Elias Church. Brampton. It's called Bramadesh. Bramad. <laughs> you all just rebuilt your church because it was burned, right? Yep, it went up. Congratulations. Thanks. Don't name it after a guy who plays with fire. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> Uh, no, but um, I, 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 well, you'll know, you'll really know we're successful when I've got um, 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 a, a parish here where they're singing in, uh, in Farsi or uh, in singing in one of the uh, uh, languages of India. Um, yes, indeed. We got like five, we got half a million people from uh, southern India here. Wow. South Asia here. Half a million. And... Um, at uh, the same time, I'm not in, if they come, come. But right now, I have my hands full with just the, the, the uh, Ukrainians and the, uh, uh, those um, non-Ukrainians uh, that God sends to us, who are of a European origin. But maybe someday, extend to others as well. Whoever God sends, we'll be happy to welcome. Sweet. Anyone else? Father, do you see a difference in the attendance by the children of the different groups? Uh, well, when they're young, when they're kids, you drag them to church, right? Yeah. When they're, when, when they're draggable, they can, you can still bring them to church. When they're teenagers, they begin to reject, react against their parents. That's normal, okay? And so, but hopefully, you know, the way you train little Ivasik, he'll keep, keep growing in that. But everybody is going to go through a period of reaction against their parents. You know, I'm very conservative. My children, I can't discuss politics with them. They're all disgusting liberals. Okay? They, they, you know, they, they have their own opinions and such. But worship 
they do come to church. So maybe since they had no choice when they were kids, they were so formed, they were so brainwashed that they come to church. The thing is to make sure that the parents bring their children to church for as long as they can. And even after, in their teenage years or at university, when they will wander, the Amish, the Mennonites, they have this. The kids will actually go away. But they're so formed that they'll come back. That they will come back and take the place of their parents. Um, sometimes the kids have to plead with their parents to bring them to church because they can't get there on their own. They can't walk there anymore. That, that, that'll happen. That'll yeah. happen. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, but... Um, uh, there is a, uh, I think, uh, well, a lot of people in their, in their 20s and 30s, they drift away. Our churches tend to be with older people because older people, one, have, are wiser very often. Uh, they got maybe the time and resources, uh, and, uh, and they know that they're not immortal. They're not going to, uh, uh, that eventually they're going to die. Children, young people think that they're going to live forever. Once you get aches and pains, you realize maybe I've got to think about the future. And so you go to church if you can. But there is a different uh, uh, attention to worship as you go through the decades of your life. Anyone else? Father has many decades of experience. He'd be glad to share. I have a question uh, about uh, benches. Benches. Yes. The curse of our church. Yes. So HIV. Because... HIV Father. of our tzarkva. Yeah, I have a question because you know, uh, in our in cathedral we have uh, we created a group of people. It's not choir. It's uh, really people that would like to pray and sing. It's like krelos. It was so different. People that at the beginning it was uh, horrible. You know, when they started to to sing together, I had idea just to lock my my uh, <laughs> secret. I agree. But after one year. Really, they uh, pray with us uh, every uh, Vesper uh, uh, at Saturday and Utrinya. Between Utrinya, they pray, they started so, and thanks God, now it's okay. But the biggest problem was when they stay together uh, in brain, in the atom block, be bench. bench, in bench. bench, they cannot hear each other. So they started just to stay uh, in front of the benches uh, and they to, came to hear each other. It was really like, like uh, a circle. Half a circle. I, I like circle. circle. And I saw that really it's a problem here in the West that especially when you have just all church in branches. Maybe it's good to have some part in branches where people can sit because it's impossible, I know. They will kill me that if I will remove it. That's right. But, uh, but really, we need some spaces in the church, uh, when, especially when you have about other things. Sometimes it's not so not, it's not it's natural. It's not natural. You know, it's like you go like I don't know, you don't you don't feel this uh, space. I saw, for example, in Rome. It's interesting. In all churches, uh, where they removed uh, branches, the, for people that would like to see, to have seats, they just put there like as, uh, it was uh, chairs with it's not glass but it's plastic visible, so you can see really this feeling of uh, space. So your ideas, what to do here in United States and Canada? Our churches were built before birth control and family planning. You have room for 2,000 people in a cathedral, something like that. You don't oh. need that anymore. The, the numbers have changed. My, my thing is, well, if you really want to get rid of pews, you're going to have to go. You know, they, the pews will stay. You will have to go. But the things can be done. It's you called a kleros. That you, look in Ukraine. In Ukraine, the older the village churches are open concept. Yes, they have seating around the periphery. Around the columns, they have a little chair, chair, so the babcha can sit down. I want to sit down sometimes, okay? But you do not have these regimented pews, which are totally contrary to our worship. Our worship is a spirit-filled, active, moving, you know, a type of, uh, of worship, whether it's incensing, whether processions, whether the kids come up to kiss the gospel, whatever you want. You, you have to have, 
You have to move. You don't put a bench in the middle of a basketball court, which is what we have done. What, now what do you do with it, though? If you try to get rid of them, they will get rid of you. Okay, so don't do that. But you can do a couple of things. One, I look at these big, long churches. Do you need all those pews? Is, will there come a time when we're going to have them filled up again? I don't know. Is it possible? How about this? Maybe to rope, up, rope off the last half. Yeah. Put these big theater ropes and rope it off, and you need it when you have a big archereska. That is a compromise. That is a big compromise. Rope, better still, better still, make get rid of them and make that area a gathering space, a, a babanitsya, a narthex, where people can socialize after liturgy, maybe that, you know, that's a gathering space. That's where you begin the wedding. That's where we begin the baptism. That's where we have the, the initial prayers at a funeral or whatever, okay? Half of those pews in most of our churches can be, and I know that this is very shocking, but are not necessary, okay? Do something with them. That's the back. The front is called a krillos. I could not serve in my church the way that most of our, the the the, the, the diak stands in front, facing forward, with a microphone in front of him. They cannot hear each other. They cannot see each other. The body language when they sing together, you can they direct each other that way. And also, if they're singing forward, the people behind them will not hear them until the sound goes forward and back again. So what we do is this. What I would recommend is to have what you have in a lot of our churches have a krillos, a elevated area in front or just a blank space in front, take out the first five or six or eight pews. Take them out. Put a couple of them so that you're facing sideways, in. You have an open area with a stand with the books on it in the center where the cantor can stand and direct on one side and on the other side. Whether you have one person singing back and forth or you have 20 people singing back and forth, antiphonally. But it's such a joy when you, and the men on one side, the women on the other. Even if you only got one woman there, eventually you'll get more. It's worked for me, it will work, okay? But you have, and so you have them singing back and forth, facing each other, able to move around, and also half facing the people, so the people are invited to participate. So my, uh, uh, very quickly, the solution for the pew thing is take a deep breath and, and do something with the back half of your pews, okay? And do something with the front half a dozen pews, move them so that you have, tell them that you need this for the wheelchairs. Okay? There you go. Whatever. Say, tell them whatever. Yeah, tell them you need this for the children to be able to sit in front. Because when you preach, you like to talk to the kids. Have them in the yes, front. Yes, indeed. Okay? But to take those first pews that are so tight up against the soleil that they're just, you can't move. You can't move. Okay? And so I would suggest the back to thank you and the front is thank you. And it works. It's just that it's a shock to people who are afraid that you're going to throw all the pews out. You can't do that and don't do that. Not yet. And so, the, the Roman church was empty like our churches, maybe with pews on the side, until the Reformation. Yeah. That's right. Everybody pews stood in the middle or sat or did whatever they did. Pews yeah. are a Protestant, uh, um, it, it beca religion becomes a spectator sport. You sit yes. there and listen to a preacher. It's not right. an act of the people anymore. So right. good luck. Okay. Last Any, anyone else with a question? Yes, Father, oh. I have, I have. Father, I understand your parish uh, had a difficult time. You have some problems, difficult situation. What do you think did you have is the biggest problem during your parish? Can you share with us? A difficult time to when? At the beginning, in the middle, or, or now? No. In totally. In totally. In totally. The biggest problems? Yes. Me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Me. I don't understand. <laughs> it's me. It's me. I'm very, I, I, it has to be like I said, my way or the highway. It's a tough lesson I've learned. But no, I, I disagree with you. You don't control really situation because, son, you're controlled a little bit. You're deacon control. You're why. 
You are not controlling no. Racine Deer, my friend. I know, you, you've been here. You've yes. been here 25 years ago. You thought, you thought I, I used to be more in control, but now my wife does all the parish work. She's the one who turned this machine on for me and told me what time I'm having it at seven, not six or whatever. So she does the office work and my daughter Anastasia does the bulletin, the websites. My son Ilya prepares the bulletin, writes it up and everything else. And, 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 and I can't decide anything here, Vladiko. I can't decide anything without consulting them or because I might, I might, they might leave me. And if they left me, I would be in trouble. And so I'm try, I try to be, I have to be very prudent. My biggest problem is my, my um, personality and my sinfulness, of course. But, um, um, but uh, I think that because God has been mercy on me, he has not sent me really big problems from outside. By beginning this parish from scratch, by having Bishop Israel Boretsky here, God rest his soul, who let us do anything. He just blessed. You know what your job is, Vladiko? When the deacon says, what's the first word the priest says to you? Blahoslove. Well, it, Bishop Israel blessed everything, the good and the bad, okay? But the good- Wise advice. We were, and we were able to do that. And so I, 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 I just, um, I had a bishop who let us make our mistakes. So like for teenagers, let them make, you know, let us make our mistakes and learn by my, our mistakes and that is. But in the meantime, the biggest problem very often is when you tend to think that you know everything and uh, you're the smartest person in, in the parish. That's not necessarily the case. So I would say the biggest problem is me. I, I have a question uh, maybe related to that. Uh, you put so much into this church and obviously you've been blessed and God wants you to continue to do his work. But when the church burned down, did that affect you personally? I mean, how did you react to that? It, it would have destroyed me, I think. Um, yeah, the um, uh, post-traumatic stress, I believe in very strongly. You know, um, I can't look at the pictures. I cannot look at the pictures. Uh, I don't want to look at the pictures. The, um, uh, the, what it really taught me was that what you have today can be gone tomorrow. Overnight, we lost the most beautiful, it was my seventh child. You know, I have six children. My church was my seventh child. Fortunately, it was the church and not any of my children, okay? But um, uh, it was um, um, losing, losing the church was, uh, put me into a situation where I've um, realized that what I have, I can lose. And one of my, one of my um, you know, with the politics today, with COVID today, with the problems that we have today, my motto is Shabihirsha Nebulo. As long as things aren't worse, because that, it was that morning, the church burned up and that was bad. But I just hope and pray that nothing worse happens in a parish, in my family, in this crazy mixed up world of ours today. Um, you know, ain't, this might, it could be a lot worse. Dr. Shaw, uh, you are grateful for what you have and appreciate it because you can lose it. That's my lesson from the, uh, from, but uh, at the same time, afterwards, the parish just, and we have it back again, it's the resurrection for us. A good, good uh, reminder that God does make things new. Father, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing your experiences with us. You know, so many of us who know something about your parish there in Brampton, we really appreciate the work that and the prayer that you and all the faithful people there have done. And so thank you for coming and being here with us tonight. Yes, indeed. Well, I thank you for the invitation. Um, like I said, I've never met a thought or seen a camera or a microphone I didn't like. Um, anytime, Davra, um, I would ask you if you are not familiar with our website, the St. Elias Church in Brampton or Friends of St. Elias. There's 555 YouTubes. You'll see Bishop Benedict there. You'll see the, the entire story is there. And um, keep in mind that we are able to do what we've done because of the perfect storm of good things that I've got here. Everybody from my formation seminary, my parents at home, my wife, my children, uh, starting a new, this is not going to happen in too many places like this. But 
it did happen here, an aspect of what we're doing here perhaps can be shared. You can take a, a cutting of what we're doing here and, and plant it in your community if you are interested, whether it's singing or architecture, uh, church, um, uh, church how, how to deal with the, with the various ethnic groups, the uh, uh, generations, whatever. See, it, we've, we've gone through it, and maybe there's something there that you can use as well. I do hope so. Dobre. Thank you, Father, very much. Bishop, would you close with prayer for us, please? Uh, Слава Отцу і Сину і Святому Духу нині по все час і навіки вічні. Амінь. Господи, помили, Господи, помили, Господи, помили, призвичайні Великого Благослови. God bless all of us, special Father Roman, now and forever and ever. Amen. Amen.